I'd like uh, to thank the Canadian public for uh, trusting me and uh, giving me a chance. That's Omar Cotter, just hours after he was released on bail a few weeks ago. Shortly after that, he gave his first in-depth interview on everything from that infamous firefight in Afghanistan to the decade he spent at Guantanamo Bay. Tomorrow night, a documentary collaboration between the CBC, the Toronto Star, and White Pine Pictures will be broadcast. And tonight, with excerpts from that new documentary about Cotter, the CBC's Terence McKenna takes a look at his side of the story. Omar Cotter made his personal debut to a Canadian audience on his lawyer's driveway in a leafy Edmonton neighborhood, not sounding like the unrepentant terrorist long described by Prime Minister Harper. Well, I'm gonna have to disappoint him. I'm, I'm better than the person he thinks I am. He was followed back into the house by a documentary crew from White Pine Pictures who recorded his early struggles to adjust to his new freedom. Oh, there you go. So that's one of the basic skills I went to learn is how to open my window. <laughs> like, I know this is real, but I've been living in prison for 12 years or 13 years, and I've been carrying myself in a particular way for that long. Um, and it's gonna take some, hopefully not too long, it's going to take some time to kind of ease up and let that guard down. Cotter was interviewed by the Toronto Star's Michelle Shepard, who wrote the book Guantanamo's Child. What I really hope is with this documentary is we presented Omar Cotter, they can, the Canadian public can judge for themselves, but they're not telling, they're not learning it through, through a filter of a writer now, we're, we're just actually seeing him. Cotter became famous because of a July 2002 battle in eastern Afghanistan. American soldiers had reports of suspicious activity at a compound near the town of Host and went over to investigate. Lane Morris was among the first American troops to approach the building. He sent in some Afghan army interpreters. The bad guys popped up and just shot them point blank in the face and, and killed both of them instantly. We returned fire and uh, called for some air support. The battle was on. First two Apache helicopters raked the compound with machine guns and Hellfire missiles. Then two A-10 warplanes strafed the building. Finally, two F-18s dropped every weapon they had, including four 500-pound bombs. Lane Morris was struck in the eye by grenade shrapnel and was evacuated by helicopter. My last memories, I looked out the, the helicopter, you know, as it kind of banked away and looked down on the compound, and it was just a smoking ruin with, with black smoke. And I thought, yeah, that, that'll That'll take care of that one. Here we have recreated what came next. A group of US Special Forces entered the compound through a breach in the wall to see if there were any survivors. What really happened in the following one minute is hotly contested. Shortly after the soldiers entered the bombed out building, they encountered gunfire. They said a lone grenade came sailing over a wall near the back of the compound. One American soldier was fatally injured. After the firing died down, they said there was only one survivor in the compound, Omar Cotter. The soldiers were astonished to find out that he spoke English and that he was Canadian. Omar Khadr was born in Toronto, but grew up being moved back and forth between Canada and Pakistan by his parents. I heard in the news yesterday from Canada. No. This is surgical hospital and this is our premises. His father was the Egyptian-Canadian Ahmed Saeed Khadr, who ran orphanages in Pakistan and Afghanistan through the 90s, where he eventually joined up with Al-Qaeda. The Khadr family moved into the Bin Laden family compound.
After the September 11th terrorist attacks in 2001, Al-Qaeda forces scattered and the Qatar family fled into the hills of eastern Afghanistan. 15-year-old Omar was given away by his father to a group of armed militants affiliated with Al-Qaeda. He was told to stay with them and act as their translator because he spoke three languages fluently. This videotape was found in the bombed-out compound in which he was captured. He tries to explain those incriminating videos of him making roadside bombs and how he came to be in that compound. First two weeks, it was just doing nothing, just regular translation, uh, groceries, and just getting things done in the around house. The second two weeks, where you know explosives started coming and they were training Afghans and they needed me to translate. I think what he would like to do now is challenge his father as a 28 year old in a way that he didn't challenge him as a 15 year old and just ask him you know what was he doing there in Afghanistan why did he send him to do this what were his views and have a discussion and I don't think that's one he had as a teenager with him. Omar says he was badly injured in the first moments of the deadly firefight with American soldiers. My worst memory and nightmares is just the whole firefight. One of the two guys threw some grenades behind the wall, and then I think there was a couple of grenades thrown inside the house. And something just exploded beside me. I got tossed. I don't know, two, three meters back. Uh, I got up and that's when I lost my left eye and my right eye was uh, pretty badly damaged. The key question in the Omar Khadr story is, did he or did he not throw the grenade that killed US Sergeant Christopher Spear? Khadr seems unsure himself. He thinks he may remember throwing a grenade, but he's not sure when or where. And I started hearing Americans and they were screaming and shouting and stuff. Um, I got scared. I was thinking, what should I do? What should I, I didn't know what to do. Um, so I thought, you know, I'm just going to throw this grenade and maybe just scare them away. Later, Cotter apparently began to doubt his own memory. There was evidence presented at his trial that he was found buried under debris just after the fatal grenade was thrown which suggested he could not have been the one to throw it. One possible explanation for Cotter's imperfect memory could be the treatment he received in the months after the battle. He was taken to the prison hospital at Bagram Air Base in Afghanistan, where he was guarded around the clock. Uh, they would turn you up to uh, like uh, the bed. Cotter has claimed that his feet and hands were shackled to the sides of the bed and that interrogators would force him to sit up to put pressure on his wounds if he did not give them the answers they wanted to hear. They told him over and over that he had killed an American soldier with a grenade. He says others around him in prison were also tortured. Like you could hear people screaming all the time. And then a guy would go for a few days, you'd hear screaming, 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 and then he would come back, just a uh, destroyed person. So you can only uh, imagine what happened to him. After he was released from the prison hospital, Cotter has said that he was frequently strung up in a cage in painful positions and repeatedly kneed in the thighs by interrogators. Cotter was also apparently hooded and tormented with vicious dogs. The sexual uh, uh, abuses. Um, people were drugged, uh, humiliated, waterboarded, uh, dogs, sleep deprivation, music. It's just, they throw uh, at you the whole book. In the courtroom proceedings against him, Cotter heard many versions of the battle that were at odds with the version he had been forced to confess to, which made him further doubt his own memories. For the first eight years, there was the one memory that I had, and I just took it as being the fact until, you know, once we got into court and, you know, witnesses started talking, I heard different versions of what happened. 
I lost conscious for over a week and I got bombed out. Is my memory more accurate than a soldier who was actually there? On one side, I killed another person, on the other side, I didn't. So it does make a huge difference. Even if Omar Khadr did throw a grenade, his military lawyers at Guantanamo presented evidence that it could not have been the grenade that killed Sergeant Christopher Spear. The government claims, uh, based on information that it developed, that uh, Omar threw a, a what's called a Russian F1 grenade. Those fragments uh, from the pineapple grenade break off in fairly significant uh, size chunks. A U.S. grenade, the grenade that was a uh, standard issue at the time, something called an M67, which emits smaller fragments, which cause smaller entry wounds. And based upon sort of a superficial examination of Sergeant Spears' wounds and examination of x-rays from this other soldier and being able to see some of the, the fragments in him, our expert has been able to say that those, at right now, appear to be more consistent with an M67 grenade than they do the Russian F1. In October 2002, Omar Khadr and many other prisoners at Bagram were rounded up and shipped to Guantanamo Bay, Cuba for further interrogation. For Cotter, it was the beginning of a 10-year-long nightmare in Guantanamo, where he was moved from camp to camp, subjected to sleep deprivation and endless interrogation. He says it left him in a fragile psychological state, uncertain of who he really was. Well, the first few years in Guantanamo, I was just all over the place emotionally and uh, uh, ideologically. I was just a mess. I would be around a bunch of people, I would start acting like them and talking like them and just doing everything they're doing and then they'd move me to a different place and I'd just adapt to the new uh, neighborhood. Some prosecution witnesses described him as a superstar in the prison, a leader who was looked up to by other prisoners because of his notoriety. For the longest time, all I would tell to anybody is that I wish that I could just get out of prison and just be the next Joe on the street who nobody knows and nobody gives a second look or a thought to. Eventually, Omar Khadr decided to plead guilty to five charges, including murder, attempted murder, spying, and conspiracy. He made an elaborate confession to every accusation. Well, that was the only way out. We tried to fight it twice, and both times they just suspended it. And so I knew that I was never going to be charged in the military commissions. The only way to get my case resolved was to take a plea deal. Cotter spent another two years at Guantanamo after his guilty plea, as the Canadian government stalled his return to serve out his prison sentence here. Canadian public opinion is still deeply divided about him. There is still widespread revulsion for his family, which likely started when I first interviewed his mother and sister in Pakistan in 2004. Your son Omar in Guantanamo is accused of killing an American soldier with a hand grenade. Yes. If that is true, are you proud of him? He was bombarded for four hours. Three of his friends who were with him had been killed. He was the only sole survivor. What did you expect him to do? Why is it? Why does nobody say you killed three of his friends? Why does everybody say he killed an American soldier? Big deal. My family is, they're very opinionated. And that's not always a smart thing. Um, they've said things that uh, was not very smart and that they shouldn't have said. Most legal experts agree that Omar Khadr is very likely to have his convictions overturned by the U.S. appeal courts. You know, I think the, the main legal issue in his case that was killing a, a soldier in conflict was never a war crime before 9-11. Those were the laws of war that were rewritten by the Bush administration and then amended by the o Obama administration. So at the time that uh, Omar Khadr allegedly threw the grenade that killed uh, the U.S. soldier, uh, Christopher Spear, it wasn't a war crime. And what his lawyers are arguing is that you can't charge him retroactively for something that wasn't a crime at the time of the alleged offense. Omar Khadr sometimes feels overcome by his massive um, transition. You know, one of those days I'm just going to jump under the bed or crawl under the bed and just cry my eyes out. 
Omar Khadr was reluctant to do this new interview, but realizes he has to work at gaining the understanding of Canadians for everything he has been through. For The National, I'm Terence McKenna in Toronto. The documentary Omar Cotter Out of the Shadows will premiere tomorrow night. That's on CBC Television at 9 p.m., 9.30 Newfoundland time.